Bienvenue, welcome everybody for this medal day uh, talks and ceremony. The first talk today is by Eric Hessels. Eric Hessels is the um, winner of the Lifetime Achievement in Physics Award. Uh, Eric did his undergraduate at Calvin College and then his PhD in Notre Dame in 1990. He is currently the Distinguished Research Professor at, at York uh, Research Chair in Atomic Physics at York University in Toronto, I guess. Some previous honors include a Canada Research Chair, the CAP Hertzberg Medal, APS Francis M. Pipkin Award, uh, Fellow of the APS, Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, and the Stacey Memorial Fellowship. Eric will talk on Precision atomic and molecular measurements to test fundamental physics, measuring the proton size and the fine structure constant, the electric dipole moment. Please, Eric. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, CAP for uh, this great honor and uh, for the opportunity to talk about my uh, work today as well. I have a lot to talk about today. I'm going to talk about uh, <clears throat> three precision measurements. One, to measure the proton size. <clears throat> excuse me, using um, hydrogen spectroscopy and then measuring the fine structure constant using the helium atom. And then our latest project is to measure the electron electric dipole moment uh, using polar molecules. And uh, that's, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, tell you. <clears throat> Somehow I'm not. <clears throat> oh, there we go. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge support from uh, generous support from the Canadian government, from NSER, from the CRC, CFI, um, Canada Research Chair, also from the US, from the NIST Precision Measurements Award, from the Northwestern Center for Fundamental Physics, um, the Templeton Foundation, the Sloan Foundation, and the Moore Foundation. And uh, just in case I don't have time to say so later, we are. Uh, with all of this funding, we're looking for uh, expanding our group. We're looking for graduate students and postdocs to join us. So please contact me if, uh, if you are such, or if you know people who would, might like to join us. <clears throat> so I'd like to start with the proton size. Um, and uh, last year we completed and published a measurement of the N equal two hydrogen lamb shift. Um, and this can be used to determine the, the uh, charge radius of the proton. So here are the N equal to hydrogen energy levels. Um, you see in particular that uh, we have the Lamb shift here. I put it in these unusual units of micro electron volts, uh, but it's, it's a small interval as, as uh, you know, and it's, it's almost entirely due to QED contributions. Um, and I've just shown a few diagrams of typical QED contributions. And uh, it has a very small contribution due to the fact that the proton has a finite size. So the electron can spend some of its time inside of the proton. And that contribution is, is just one half of a uh, nano EV, a small portion of the, of the lamp ship. <clears throat> the QED part has uh, been calculated, and here's the result. Um, it's been calculated, this is a lot of work. Uh, last five decades have gone into calculating this work, uh, but it's been calculated to an accuracy of a part per million, and everyone believes that calculation, that a part per million uh, uncertainty. And that allows one to determine the proton size to 1% accuracy, uh, even though it's a small part of the, uh, the lamp shift. And this theory has now been stable for two decades. And uh, as I say, it's, it's, it's considered very reliable. And by using uh, QED calculations, people have been able to determine the size of the proton uh, from hydrogen spectroscopy. Also, they've been able to from electron scattering. So we've known the size of the proton for the last two decades. And, uh, and it's given by this band over here. And all of that, uh, was blown up 10 years ago when people measured muonic hydrogen and they found uh, there's a much smaller uncertainty in this band. They found out that the proton size is actually that big. Um, so there's a seven standard deviation difference between the size of the proton as determined from um, electrons and that determined from 
um, you on the stove. So what's the difference? I mean, is there some new physics that leads to a different radius depending on whether you use electrons or muons? Um, this became known as the proton size puzzle, and there have been hundreds of papers written about how this might be resolved. Our contribution was that we decided to remeasure the 2s, 2p, the standard lamb shift interval in ordinary hydrogen. This is the same interval that was measured in muonic hydrogen, so it's, uh, it's a direct analogy to the measurement that, uh, that was recently done. We're using radio frequency fields and a variation of the Ramsey separated oscillatory field technique. And in particular, we're measuring this particular um, interval shown in green between these two hyperfine states of, uh, of the hydrogen atom. I should tell you a little bit about my history of, uh, with respect to the lamb shift. I first tried to measure the lamb shift when I was an undergraduate for my undergraduate research project. Um, that was in 1983 at Calvin College. Um, this led me to doing my graduate work with the person who had the most precise measurement of the lamb shift, Steve Lundin at, at Notre Dame. We ended up not measuring the lamb shift, but we did some other work there. And then in 2010, um, when this radius, proton radius problem came up, um, I decided to get back into the lamb shift game. And I'd just like to note that it took me 36 years to, uh, to finish my undergraduate research program. And last year, 36 years later, we, we finished it. It was 36 years from when Lamb first measured the, the lamb shift until when I started measuring the lamb shift. So, my history of the lamb shift covers half of, of the history of, of the lamb shift. How did we measure the lamb shift? Well, we started with 50 keV protons. We uh, charge exchange with a gas. We happened to use hydrogen gas. 4% um, of them neutralize into the 2s metastable state. Um, as I said before, we we're looking for a particular hyperfine state. So we want to empty the F equal one state because we don't want to study those. We use RF fields to empty those states. Um, and then we, um, we use two fields, separated oscillatory fields to, uh, to drive the, the transition of interest at 910 megahertz. We again empty the F equal one state to make sure that they're not influencing our measurement. And then what we do is we see how many um, two S atoms make it through this whole obstacle course. And we do that by mixing the two S with two P with an electric field. The two P state decays down with a Lyman alpha photon. We send that Lyman alpha photon into a gas detector. Um, it ionizes the gas, we collect the ions. And, uh, and that's how we get our signal. As I said, we're using a new technique. The technique is called the Frequency Offset Separated Oscillatory Fields Technique, or FOSOF for short. And what we do is we have two fields in these two regions that are offset in frequency from each other. And because of that offset, the two regions are in phase and then out of phase and then shifting back into phase. Um, at the beat frequency. So they're just cycling in and out of phase with each other. And this is the sort of signal that we get from this. The, uh, this is just the beat frequency between the RF going to the two regions. And this is the Lyman alpha signal that we get out of our detector. <clears throat> so you can see there are regions where the atomic signal, the transition is in phase here and out of phase here. For, for driving the transition. And the key to the whole thing is that when these two are in phase with each other, that is the beat signal from the RF is in phase with the atomic signal, that's when we're on resonance. And so that is to say, as we go from this region to this region, the RF is advancing with the frequency associated with F, but the atoms are advancing with a frequency associated with F0. And if they're advancing at the same rate, then we, uh, then we get these two signals being exactly in phase with each other. 
it's critical that we uh, learn about all possible phase delays. We have to know exactly what phase the RF is in these two regions. And if we're worried about that, what we do is we cancel any possible error by reordering which how these two regions occur. We do that by taking our entire RF system, our generators, our amplifiers, our cables, and, and our regions. They're all rigidly connected to each other through a big 18-inch uh, vacuum feed-through, and we rotate the entire thing so that the, uh, that the atoms see the uh, regions in the opposite order, and that cancels most of our, uh, our phase problems. And then we get this wonderful line shape that basically looks like a straight line. It's not exactly a straight line, but it's very close. And its intercept um, gives us the resonant frequency. So this is as a function of the RF frequency, and this is the phase difference between those two curves that I had, the beat frequency and the atomic signal. Uh, Phil fits well to a straight line. We actually did about a century CPU of modeling to, uh, to fully understand this line shape. Um, and that was necessary to understand all the systematic effects. You see the residuals that, uh, say that we did get the line shape correct. This is about 90 minutes of uh, data and has a statistical uncertainty of two kilohertz. And that's beyond what we really wanted to get. So that's great, except we still had to spend 10 years doing this measurement, studying systematic effects. And in the end, we, uh, used 116 repeats of experiments like this, most of them taking much longer than, than 90 minutes. Um, and we use different parameters, different speeds of the beam, different separations between the two separated fields, different field strengths, and so on. And I really won't have a chance to go into all the, uh, all the studies that we did, but I'll just give you our results here. Uh, this is uh, giving the results for various field strengths for various separations and for various speeds, you can see that they all are consistent one with the other. <clears throat> In the end, we get an uncertainty of 3.2 kilohertz. Uh, statistics um, are about 1.4 kilohertz the way we uh, calculated. We actually did much better statistically, but most of the statistics were used to study systematic effects. And then there are these systematic effects, which, uh, which are really the whole story of this experiment, but I won't really have time to explain how we how we got to get those under control over the over the nine years that we did the measurement. Okay, so here's again the discrepancy between the the uh, old measurements, the new measurement. In the intervening years, while we were doing our measurement, two other people completed a measurement, and one. Uh, both in hydrogen, one agreed with the small radius and one agreed with the large radius. So we got to be the tiebreaker here. And there we are. Um, so we, we uh, favor the small radius. And I would say at this point, the proton size puzzle is basically over. Why? Because we have this very precise measurement in muonic hydrogen, and now the two most precise measurements in hydrogen agree with it. We, of course, have to understand why some of the previous measurements didn't agree, but that's, uh, <clears throat> that's uh, future work. Since that time, there's been a new measurement of electron scattering that, uh, that also agrees with the small radius, and a new measurement in hydrogen, which is the same interval as this interval was, but by a different group in Garshi. And uh, all of these now favor the, the small interval. So. Okay, that's all I have to say about the proton size. Let me move on then to the fine structure constant. <clears throat> the fine structure constant, uh, we did a uh, measurement of the n equal to triplet p fine structure in atomic helium. And this is part of a part per billion uh, program to test QED, to look for possibles beyond the standard model physics, and, uh, and also to determine the, uh, the fine structure constant. And this is a very different uh, measurement. Uh, the measurement's done with a thermal beam of metastable 2s atoms uh, that we create in a discharge. And then we collimate that beam and concentrate the beam uh, using laser cooling techniques. That gives us a very intense beam that we can then interact with lasers and microwaves to drive it up to the 2p state and then drive transitions 
oh, sorry, between the, the two P states. Um, and then we can uh, detect these atoms with near unity uh, detection efficiency by laser exciting them up into a high end state. And we can start to ionize them and then collect the resulting ions. Again, we're using this new FOSOF technique. Um, in this case, we have just fabulous, fabulous signal to noise. In fact, such good signal to noise that we can do experiments that span 10 lifetimes. So we just give up the factor of e to the minus 10 in signal size that happens from doing an experiment over 10 lifetimes. Um, and here, these, these data points, if you look closely, you can see error bars. And those error bars are the error bars you get when you take 20 milliseconds of data. Uh, so this, this is just incredible uh, signal to noise. Here's again our line shape that looks a lot like a straight line. If you blow it up by a factor of 100, you can see that it's not, and then subtract the straight line off, you can see that there's a slightly non-straight line part. And then if you look at the residuals to these by blowing this up by another factor of 100, you can see that the, the residuals agree with the expected line shape. So we have such good signal to noise that we can test whether we get the same result independent of what type of experiment we do. So we, we vary almost every parameter we can in our experiment, the magnetic field, the timing, the, the strength of the lasers, the, the uh, how, how much of the resonance we fit to get the separated oscillatory field line shape. We can restrict ourselves to low or high powers. We can, we can do it with or without uh, the laser cooling. We can use different states to detect. We, we, this is just a small set of the things we do. We can see we get excellent consistency regardless of how we do the measurement. In the end, we get uh, a measurement that's accurate to 25 Hertz. If we want to take full advantage of that measurement, so we've measured this smaller interval, we also need a measurement at a similar accuracy for the larger interval, and we're doing that now in our lab using the same technique. And we need someone, so if there are QED theorists in the audience, uh, we need someone to, uh, to calculate the alpha to the 8 m mc squared contributions to the QED calculation. And that's under consideration by the group of Lipitsky now, um, if we can get all of that together, we'll have a part per billion test of QED. We'll be testing some possible physics beyond the standard model. In particular, this will give the strongest test by a factor of 100 of exotic spin-dependent electron-electron interactions. And it'll also give a half part per billion determination of the fine structure constant. Why do we want to know the fine structure constant? We can also get the fine structure constant by the electron G minus two measurement or from atom interferometry. But if we compare the fine structure constants we get from those three, or if we use our fine structure constant for the G minus two measurement, then we can let the G minus two measurement be what it should be, which is a test for physics beyond the standard model. Because that measurement is so accurate, it's limited only by how well we know the electron, we, how well we know the fine structure constant. If we knew it better, we'd actually be testing for things like um, dark matter candidates that, that could be there at low energy. Okay, so sorry to rush through this, but I did want to talk about three different things all in, in one talk. So I'm going to now talk about the electron electric dipole moment. Uh, so recently we started a major new initiative to try to measure the electron electric dipole moment. Um, we started a collaboration called EDM cubed, which stands for electric dipole measurements using molecules in a matrix. Um, and what we plan to do is we're planning to make measurements of the electron electric dipole moment using polar molecules that are frozen in an argon solid. Um, this might allow for an improved electron electric dipole moment limit uh, of three of five orders of magnitude or, or possibly even more. And why do we want to do it? We want to test for physics beyond the standard model, of course. <clears throat> the 
standard model predicts that the electron does have an electric dipole moment. Um, nobody's actually calculated it, but it's about 10 to the minus 40 e centimeters, we think. But most extensions to the standard model predict a much larger electron electric dipole moment. Um, if we do see an electric electron, an electron electric dipole moment, it implies that there's T violation, or if you believe in CPT, uh, CP violation. And uh, that's important because we need CP violation, strong CP violation, to uh, explain the matter antimatter asymmetry in the universe. And if we could measure the electron electric dipole moment, we could therefore be guiding standard model extensions. The current limit that we have on, not we, but uh, we as a physics community have on, um, on the electric dipole moment, uh, already tests physics at the 10 to 100 TeV level. If we could improve that by four orders of magnitude, it would start to test uh, physics at 100 times that or above the PeV level. So, so we can test very high energy physics using a, uh, a precision measurement. All measurements of uh, electric dipole moments are performed by watching electrons, electrons process in a magnetic field. Um, and then finding whether the precession changes when you have a, an electric field that's either parallel or, or anti-parallel to the, to the magnetic field. And then, uh, so the, the, the precession is proportional to the magnetic field and then plus or minus a contribution from the, from the electric field. For modern experiments, the electric field is produced inside of a polar molecule. It's the best way to get a big electric field. And for modern experiments, the, the uncertainty has always been statistically limited. And it's given by you know, the bigger electric field you have, the better or the more electrons you watch um, precess, the better off you are. And the longer you watch them precess, the better off you are. Uh, you can't really get very far on the electric field because um, there are no polar molecules that give you more than 100 gigavolts per centimeter, huge fields. Um, so, but what you can do is try to get more, more electrons and more time, and that's, that's what we're trying to do. So the current limit is 1 times 10 to the minus 19 e centimeters, and that uses 10 to the 12 electrons each study for a millisecond. That's in thorium monoxide, and, uh, and that's in a beam, and so they're, you only have one millisecond because they're passing by you in a beam. So we're going to embed our molecules. That means that we can hold them for a long time. Argon is transparent, so we can do laser spectroscopy, fluorescence. Um, and most importantly, the matrix orients the molecules. The molecules end up being oriented perpendicular to the cube faces, and that means we don't need an electric field to, to orient our molecules. We can get large numbers of molecules and uh, precession times of, of somewhere between a millisecond and a second should be possible. So how many, how many molecules can we get? Well, we think that we can make a millimeter cubed of argon, a part per billion of barium monofluoride in it, something like 10 to the 10 barium monofluoride molecules if we watch them process for about 10 milliseconds and then we reuse the molecules do that for a month we will effectively study somewhere between 10 to the 15 and 10 to the 18 electrons depending on how quickly we can uh, we can reuse each each uh, uh, molecule so rather than the 10 to the 12 that acme had we have 10 to the 15 and we can also study them for for a longer time that gets us down to statistical limits of, we hope, as good as 10 to the minus 31 or 10 to the minus 33 e centimeters. Um, of course, we could get better if we wanted to go to a cubic centimeter of, uh, of argon um, or a larger electric field if we went to a molecule that was that's harder to use, but, uh, but uh, still quite possible. And uh, we can get five times better if we did two years of data. So, I mean, we can get, we think, many orders of magnitude beyond the, the current limit. Um, I am running short on time, so I won't tell you the, the whole scheme, but 
the scheme is the same as other EDM measurements, it involves optical pumping and microwave transitions between the ground state, the ground hyperfine states of, of this molecule that's captured within the, uh, within the argon. We think that we can control systematic effects well. Um, that's because we have excellent signal to noise. We have a small sample, which makes it easy to control fields. We have no applied electric field that gets rid of a lot of systematic effects. We have, we have molecules that are pointing in all directions, but in particular upward and downward, and we can measure those simultaneously to cancel certain effects. They're cold, that cancels out a lot of physics. They're stationary, that gets rid of a bunch of systematic effects. And then we have lots of ways that we thought that we're going to study these uh, as well. We have a team put together, um, and we would, of course, like people to join our team. And uh, we've been making some good progress to date. We've done lots of modeling. We set up an entire lab. We set up a vacuum system, a cryogenic system. We've made transparent argon, set up laser systems. We've uh, made isotopically pure barium monofluoride. Um, and we've secured $3 million of funding for the next three years to, to continue this project. And so that's, that's all I'm going to say about it. And in conclusion, we've measured the N equal to lamp shift, um, helping to resolve the proton size problem. We've measured the N equal to triple P fine structure um, as a test at the part per billion level for uh, QED and to help determine the fine structure constant. And now we're doing this new EDM cube test to uh, try to measure the electron electric dipole moment. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.